Let your love shine through us, Lord. Let your spirit flow through us tonight and reach out to others, God, this earth. Lord, we praise you tonight. Thank you for this opportunity that we have tonight, Lord, to come and worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I was shackled by a
Can we give the Lord praise tonight? It's an honor to get to be in the presence of the Almighty. Hallelujah. I want you to worship with this choir as they sing tonight.
I've had a real good day, you know, not really, but uh, I just want y'all to listen to these words in the second verse. We're going to sing it, and I want y'all to help us sing the rest of the song, and I want y'all to just do it with all your heart. I want you to just lift up your, uh, your voices and sing this song, and let God know that we appreciate everything he's done. Lord, I see a world is dying, wounded by the master of the sea. shine down on me. Oh, he's the bright, he's the morning star, lily of the valley, rose of Sharon. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, have your way, Lord, in this place. Continue, Lord, to keep our hearts soft and sensitive to you, Jesus. Lord, we give you glory today. We give you glory in this house, Lord. There is none other but you. I just ask you, Lord, to continue to bless in this offering. 
Continue to bless, Lord, as we preach your word, as we, as we open our hearts to what you want to say in this house. Lord, I ask you to do a work in this place. A work beyond human understanding, a work beyond human ingenuity. Speak to us, Lord, from heaven. Speak to us, Lord. Lord, we bless and praise you. You are worthy of all glory. Thank you, Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you, musicians, choir. You can be seated for just a moment. Gentlemen are going to wait on the congregation for tithes and offerings tonight. If you will receive that, just a couple of small piddly things, nothing uh, to really take up a lot of time with. Just don't forget the fall festival coming up. Pray for Glenn and Shelly. Uh, they uh, left out after service. You may have seen their mother home parked out here. As Brother uh, Shannon said, for a much deserved, much needed vacation. And uh, very thankful uh, for all that's done here and for all that folks do. And um, I want to keep them going. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I want to keep them going. I, I don't want to burn them out. Don't want to, you know, I want to keep them going. Thank you, Brother Shannon, for obeying the Lord tonight, stepping up. And uh, yes, yes. And yes, give the Lord praise. That's all right. So thankful, so thankful. God knows what we need when we need it. He knows how to get it out of us too. Amen. Well, turn back to the book of Revelation chapter 3. Let's stand one more time, or maybe it won't be the one more time, but maybe another time. Uh, I hope you'll stand up again at some point. Uh, I don't want to preach you to death tonight, but <clears throat> I mean, I haven't had anybody fall out a window and die off the second floor yet, so I uh, hadn't quite reached that level. Paul preached all night, so I don't think anybody should complain. He preached till somebody's falling out the window. They went, prayed him up, brought him back in. He kept preaching. I mean, they just never missed a beat. Said, "Oh, he's fine. Let's go back up there." We're, we're to, I mean, they, when you read it, that's the impression you get. He fell out. They all got concerned, thought he was dead, went out there. Paul basically looked at him, said, "No, I'll get him up. No, we're we're fine. I got to finish my message. I only got halfway through it. Get him back in here." Man, don't need nobody falling out no windows. Just get on back in here. Shut the window. Don't sit so close next time. But I got a message to preach. Amen. 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 Continuing gold tried in the fire. Revelation 3 and 18. But after we read that, keep your Bible open. Remain standing. I want to read a couple of verses here before you're seated. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. How many of you want to be rich toward God? Amen. Not rich in material things, rich in the glory of the Lord, rich in his resources, his power. White raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness doth not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Now turn back to Revelation chapter 1, and let's look at the example of this in the very person of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks in the midst of those seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man. Remember, I mentioned it last week, but pay careful attention. He says, Son of Man, for a reason. Not just the Son of God, but Son of Man. This individual, though glorified, though mighty, though God, I mean, there in front of him in this vision, he's still also an example of what we are to be in Christ. He didn't say just like one like the Son of God. He said one like the Son of Man. Clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. That's, that's kind of the key that I want you to pay careful attention to. His feet like a defined brass, as if they burned in a furnace. A voice that, that sounded, or a voice as the sound, should I say, of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his hand upon me, saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth that was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and death. Praise God. Turn down now, if you will, to chapter number 19. Where we left off this morning and we'll pick this up and just highlight this and then we'll preach a, a while <clears throat> until people start falling over, I reckon, falling out. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Brother Aaron asked me back there, he said, 
He said, you said we can pray while you're preaching. Does that mean we can close our eyes? I said, yeah, as long as you're not snoring, that's all right. If you're preaching or praying, rather, that's all right. <clears throat> Look with me at Revelation chapter number 19. Look at verse 12. When John sees him in all of his splendor, remember, verse 6, it said that the, the, the message of heaven was, Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigning. And the next thing he sees is Jesus coming out in that white horse in all of the splendor and glory. But I want you to focus mainly upon verse 12. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written no man knew but he himself. His eyes were as a flame of fire. I want to continue tonight dealing with gold tried in the fire. Uh, and we're dealing with those eyes of fire. You can be seated this morning. Those eyes are this evening. I don't know what day it is or what morning, evening, whatever. <clears throat> Amen. The eyes of fire. Tonight, if I was if I was going to title this message independent from the series, I would have called it the eyes of glory. And I will show you why I say that. Isaiah makes that statement, and we'll get to that in a little bit. This morning, we dealt with uh, the eyes being anointed with the eye salve that we might see. And I told you that we must, we must have the right position if we're going to see the vision God intends us to see. Yeah. That it all depends on where you're looking from as to what you see. You can stand in one place and look at a distant uh, item on the horizon and see it one way, move your position and see it differently. It all depends on where you're looking from. I went to great lengths this morning to deal with that. Tonight, I want to kind of cap that thought off by realizing something. When Jesus tells us these things in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, when he tells each one of these churches who he is, what he expects, what he's not finding in them, he gives them always a characteristic of himself. Always. He, he'll say, hey, this is uh, the one that's speaking to you is he that was dead but am alive. He that's speaking to you is the one that has the stars in his right hand standing amongst the candlesticks. All of these things. But when you get to the very last one, when he's speaking to the church of the Laodiceans, he says, I counsel you by a meat gold tried in the fire. White raiment that you might be clothed and anoint thine eyes with eyes have that you might see. Now, when we return back to Revelation chapter 1, the first vision that God gave to John was a vision of Jesus himself. May I just tell you tonight that what you need to see tonight is not a way out of your problem. It's not a solution. You don't need to see the particulars. What you and I must see if things are going to be made right is we must see something fresh of Jesus. We must see that. I, I shared with you in time past how that when John wrote this great book, matter of fact, when he wrote his gospel, the three epistles and the book of Revelation, these were the last books to be penned in our Bible. It was the last of the writings of God by the Spirit to the New Testament church. John is living in a time when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is already starting to have problems, not because of God, but because of man. Man has intermingled with other things, tried to dilute it. The devil has come in and tried to obscure the word of God. So when John is commanded to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, he is to write a fresh revelation of Jesus. That's why when you read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, you will find they carry kind of a, a very similar tone. They're different. Their audience was intended to be different. So they do carry differences. But when you line those up, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all seem to have this uh, this common sentiment about them. But when you get to the book of John, the gospel of John rather, you find out that it is it just feels totally different. It has a totally different feel to it. You want to know why? Because when John wrote it, it was after all the others had been written. And John goes back and he says, Church, what you need is to see a fresh image of who Jesus is. What you need is to realize, I want to just remind you folks, what you need tonight is not necessarily a detailed answer in your prayer. What you need is to see him that answers that prayer. When I can get a fresh look at him, I can certainly have confidence that he'll answer. 
Amen. When I see that this is the God that measured the universe with the span of his hand. When I see that this is the God that speaks and worlds come into existence. When I see that this is the God that parts seas and rivers. Are you hearing me? When I see this is the God that raises the dead, opens the blind eyes, cures cancer and sickness, speaks to the, oh God, help me, speaks to the devil and he has to flee. When I see this is the God that I'm dealing with, i got caught. Confidence that when I ask him, he will answer. That's what we need tonight. But we don't necessarily need all of this stuff. That's why I get I, I, I get very agitated when and, and it just it's, maybe it's just one of my many uh, things that agitates me on a very long list. I'm trying to crucify every day. But when folks start making the Book of Revelation out to be some sort of entertainment, uh, 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 you know, a script. Uh, we, we, we try to make it to be something fantastic and something that uh, requires a bunch of uh, fantasy along to make it, oh, listen to me. I, I hear people say junk like, oh, the, uh, turn to the book of Revelations. We're going to preach from the book of Revelations. Or, or they make movies and books and they make it to be so uh, Hollywood-esque, if you will, that it, it loses the very heartbeat of it. Folks, listen to me. It is none other. That book is so simple, uh, even a child can get it out of it. What do you mean, Pastor? How can you understand the bowls, the trumpets, all of these things? Listen, all of that boils down to one thing. Thing, folks, and it is a vision, a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. When John starts the book, he said, every eye shall see him. He's coming in the clouds and every eye shall see him. He said, I turned and looked and I saw him. When it gets to the end of chapter number 19, he said, I looked, heaven was open, I saw him. Remember, I highlighted a lot of that this morning. And at the end of this book, Jesus said, I come quickly. I come quickly. In other words, you can stress and worry over the Antichrist, the beast, the whore of, that, of Babylon, all of those different symbols and signs till you lose your sleep at night. I'm not stressing about any of it. I don't, I don't really care who the ten kingdoms are. I don't care about all of that. Listen to me. I, I used to be absolutely just eat up with prophecy, studying the book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation. I, we could take off on some prophetic message tonight, but I, that is, I've long since lost the desire for that because the more I dig into it, the more it comes back to Jesus. I said, the more it comes back to Jesus. You can draw a crowd telling them that that, you know, some sign in the universe, some blood moon or something tells us something all this. Folks, I don't need a blood moon to tell me Jesus is coming back. He told me he was coming back 2,000 years ago. Be watchful. Be ready. I'll come in an hour which you think not. The sun. I, I'm not stirred up by any of that. I, I, I remember to hear and tell one preacher uh, met with a guy. This guy told him, he said, Said, um, he said, you know, I, I, I recently, these stupid stories go all over the internet, around the emails, all this stuff too. But this one man said he was talking to another individual and said that he was out driving, picked up this hitchhiker. Picked up this hitchhiker and he, and he, he said that hitchhiker said, I, I've just come to tell you, Jesus is coming. And, he, and the man looked out the window, looked back, and the man disappeared out of his car. Oh, man, and this guy was telling this preacher this, you know, and he was like all beside himself. Can you believe it? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Man, that guy was right there. Had to be an angel. Just disappeared. When that man drove on, got into town, went to the uh, little gas station, he said, I just had the weirdest thing happen. He told him what happened, and the gas station attendant said, man, you're about the 10th or 11th person said that. That's been happening all day. And this man sitting across with the preacher telling this story. I mean, he's just, I mean, eyes are just glazed over. He's just all beside himself. Man, don't that excited the preacher looked at him and said no not particularly he said what do you mean why not he said I don't need some hobo on the side of the road tell me Jesus is coming you believe whatever you want to believe but I've, I've read it in this book he's coming back and I don't need some disappearing act to tell me that I, I'm not telling you God can't move that way but my God he said I will return what we need is to get our eyes back on Jesus and get off of the fringe things that's got us distracted can you say amen I, listen to me. We ought to pray for our politicians. We ought to pray for a nation. God instructs us to do that. Pray for the governments around the world. We ought to do that. But folks, at the end of the day, there's only one government. All the rest of them are going to collapse. And there's one. And the Bible said of his kingdom, there shall be no end. My Jesus rules and reigns. Hallelujah. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. My God. So when John did that book of Revelation. He said, the first thing God showed me, I turned around and looked. Oh, my God, there's Jesus. 
He said, matter of fact, I didn't even hardly recognize him. I fell down as dead. That ain't the Jesus I remembered. And I fear that, folks, every one of us, well, I don't fear necessarily, I shouldn't say it that way, but I believe every one of us, when we finally lay eyes on him, something inside of us is going to be, my Lord, that's not what I learned in Sunday school. My God, that, that ain't what I remember. My Lord, they told me about this. He's not this lowly carpenter. We're going to see that God with eyes like a flame of fire, feet that are, uh, that are just hot like a burning brass. I mean, a white garment all the way down to the feet. A hair white as wool. Are you hearing me? I, 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 don't, I, I don't need anything else. I just need to see Jesus. You see, in that book of Revelation, we find that when Jesus said in Revelation 3 and 18, he said, look, I counsel you, buy of me gold tried in the fire, white raiment you might be clothed, and I salve that you might be able to see. Jesus, back in Revelation 1, gave us the example of what that individual would look like. If we were absolutely purely like Jesus, hair white as wool, a garment down to the foot, feet like brass. We, I mean, oh God, are you hearing me? You say, but pastor, that's how God was doing. That's Christ. Oh, that was the son of man. And the Bible said, when I see him, I shall be. My God, are, are you hearing me? The Bible said, I shall be like him for I shall see him as he is. John told me that in his epistles. What he's saying is when John saw him, he was giving us an example of what my life and your life is to be. Each one of those elements are symbolic of a spiritual activity going on in my life. I certainly have no time to go over all of them today. Night, but I want to deal one characteristic that in Revelation 3 and 18, when he says, Anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you might see the very eyes of Jesus Christ were as a flame of fire. Uh -huh. Oh, that tells me something. The Bible says this. I want you to listen very carefully. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 3, and verse number 8, it says, Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen. Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of glory. If I wasn't preaching this as part of this series, that would have been the title of my message. The eyes of glory. He said they have provoked the eyes of his glory. To show their countenance doth witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked, though, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. Now, it tells us in Revelation 1 that the eyes of Christ are as a flame of fire. Isaiah chapter 3 tells me that those eyes, they're called the eyes of glory. Remember we, when we talked about um, the, the gold tried in the fire, we talked about the glory of God. The Bible says in Isaiah 3 that his eyes are eyes of glory. Now, what it means by eyes of glory is that when Isaiah, and later in chapter 6 that I dealt with this morning, he saw him. He saw his eyes as a flame of fire. That doesn't mean he was shooting fireballs out of his eyes. It means they were so glorious, and I'm going to show you in a minute, that he was not given at any time that in the Bible, God, that, that an, an individual gives a description of the image of God that he sees. Never can words adequately describe that glory. They come as close as possible. I'm going to show you that in a minute in the book of Ezekiel. They come as close as possible, but certainly our words, our language is inadequate. To express the living God. John said he had eyes like a flame of fire. They were so bright and burning. Isaiah 3 says that they are eyes of glory. Now fire, now listen to me carefully. Fire primarily has two purposes. Fire, which obviously uh, is the, the primitive uh version of light, of artificial light to a degree, if you would say it that way. Light or fire has two primary purposes. Number one, that primary purpose is to reveal something. You want to see something, you turn a light on. Am I right? Number two, not only does that light or that fire reveal something, it also refines. That fire is used for two purposes. To reveal or to refine. That's the two primary purposes, I should say. And when we see here in Isaiah 3 and 8, he says, look, you have angered the Lord, basically. He's saying, 
Jerusalem is ruined. Judah is fallen. Why? Because of their tongue and their doings. They are against the Lord. They have provoked the eyes of his glory. Now, if the eyes of the Lord are to reveal and to refine something, what I want to show you tonight is this. Is that those eyes that are as a flame of fire are always on you. Now, that should, both, that should both terrify you and excite you. Hello? Because not only are his eyes always on you watching and, and seeing everything that goes on in your life, but his eyes are upon you to watch over you as well. He's not just watching you. He's watching over you. And we're talking about when John saw him, he said, I saw his eyes as a flame of fire. In other words, there was nothing that could stand in its way. In other words, he could see through every facade and he could burn through every attack. Can you say amen? His eyes are over me. It reveals, it refines. And he says in Isaiah 3, these are the eyes of glory, folks. These aren't just regular eyes. We're all the time worried about what somebody else sees. Now, as a believer, we ought to maintain our witness, our testimony. I get that. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. Shun the very appearance of evil. All of that is absolutely correct. But folks, we also cannot worry more about what somebody else thinks or sees in us than we do God. If we get it right before God, it'll be right before everybody else. And if it's not right with everybody else, that's their problem. I'm right with God. That's why the Bible says in the book of Genesis, it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Can you say amen? The Bible said David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Go through the kings and you'll find that some of them, uh, uh, like Omri and Ahab and others, did evil in the sight of the Lord. But others, like Jehoshaphat and others, did right in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord is over the righteous and his ear is attentive to their cry. Folks, I want to tell you, those eyes of glory are on you all the time. The Bible tells me in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 33, it says this in verse 13. Hear you that are afar off. What have I done that you are near? Acknowledge my might. The sinners of Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Listen to this. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? And who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burning? He that walketh uprightly and speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppression, shaketh his hands from the holding of bribes. That stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given to him. His waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is afar off. What are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you the eyes of glory, the eyes of fire are upon you so that your eyes might equally be upon him. But God said my eyes are against the wicked. The Bible goes on to say, and I want you to listen. As a matter of fact, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ezekiel chapter number 1 very quickly. Because it's going to take me a minute to really press this point home. Ezekiel chapter number 1. I'll give you a minute to get there, but it is very important that you see this. Ezekiel chapter number 1. We're talking about the eyes of glory tonight. His eyes were as a flame of fire, Revelation chapter 1 said. Are you there, Ezekiel 1? Amen. I'm going to skip around a little bit because there's quite a bit to cover, but I certainly do not have time to read it all. But if you'll look, Ezekiel in chapter 1 has given a vision of the glory of God. He's given a vision of the throne of God, that mighty government, if you will, of, in heaven. And the Bible said in chapter 1 in verse 4, look with me. And this kind of piggybacks on what we talked about this morning. But notice something. In verse number 4, Ezekiel, the man of God, he's called the son of man throughout his book. But it says this, I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, and out of the midst of the fire. My God, now watch this. 
He said also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now remember this morning we talked about two other individuals that saw these four living creatures. Isaiah and John saw them around that throne, remember. But I want you to not pay so much attention to that tonight as I want you to pay careful attention to two words that you're going to find as I read. Number one is the likeness and number two the appearance. The likeness and the appearance. In verse 5, he says, Out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of man. Now, pause there for a moment because we're, we're going to get a little deeper here. But when you say something had the likeness of something, well, uh, let me say, well, it looked kind of like dot, dot, dot. Are you with me? Well, what did it look like? Well, it, it kind of had the appearance of dot, dot, dot. Before I get into reading it, I want you to be on, on stable ground. Ezekiel, when he is, is, is echoing what he has seen, he sees things that his, uh, his language and vocabulary cannot begin to describe. I'm talking tonight about your glorious God. I want you to know that. And I want it to spark not only terror but excitement in you. Terror because we know his eyes are on us, but excitement because his eyes are on us. Amen. And Ezekiel said, oh, all I can tell you, it was kind of like this. Now keep that in mind. So what does he say? In verse 5, he said there was the likeness of four creatures. Their appearance and their likeness was as a man. Verse number 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion. And on the right side, they had four, the face of an ox. The left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Now, how do you describe that in normal language? What did they look like? Uh, uh, about that uh, all I could tell you was kind of like this they looked sort of like a man but had four faces on all four sides uh, they had one like a man an ox had an eagle I mean I, I, mean, I don't know I, I, that's the only way I know to describe it keep that thought let's keep going now as you're going into chapter number 1 and verse number 13 as for the likeness of the living creatures their appearance was like burning coals of fire. He didn't have anything to describe it. That's all he could do. It was like burning coals of fire, like the, come on, you can help me out, like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. The living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of the flash of lightning. He said these things were burning with fire like coals of fire and they shot out and came back and the only way I could say it was like the appearance of lightning. My God, I want you to get a vision of what this, we're talking about our God, folks. He goes on to say in verse 16, the appearance of the wheels and of their work was like it in the color of barrel that they four had one likeness and their appearance and their work were as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Do I believe that the throne room and the government of God operates on wagon wheels? Absolutely not. But John saw something circular. They turned and moved and wheels inside of wheels like some well-oiled machine. He had no way to describe that. He said it's the likeness of this. It's the appearance of that. But that's as far as my vocabulary can reach. God, keep that going. Look what he says. He says it again in verse 17 at the end. He says, uh, not about the appearance, but to, to press hold the idea of the eyes and see. He said, those rings were full of eyes. In verse 22, it says, and the likeness of the firmament that was upon their heads of the living creatures was as the color, watch this, was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. He said, I saw these creatures and they had a firmament or a platform, a level that was above their heads. Now don't miss where this is going. God, this, this, for some reason, this just shook me. Notice, they had the likeness of a firmament over their heads. He goes on to say, verse 26, 
Remember, he's been describing just these creatures that are there. And then he says, I looked up a little higher. And he says there was something above that firmament. That firmament was a layer of separation. He first of all saw created beings that I wouldn't want to run head on, head into. I mean, I'm telling you, folks. I mean, you imagine these creatures: six wings, four faces on them. They had fire inside of fire. I mean, they were shooting in and out like lightning, moving up and down, in and out. My God, I'm telling you, it's terrible. Ezekiel saw this and said, whoa, I don't even know what I'm looking at. But he said, then I looked and it was like there was a layer on top of them. Oh, my God. And then I looked and there was something above that layer. And here's where it gets bigger and bigger. In verse 26, he said, above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. I don't know any other way to describe this. He said, above that layer, there was something that the only way I can describe it, it looked like a throne. And he said it was as the appearance of sapphire stone. I mean, as blue as blue can be. And he said, upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. Oh, Paul's right there a second. My God, folks, hey, you say, why are you talking? I'm just talking about our God tonight. Do you mind if we just talk about how grand and glorious our God is? I'm talking about eyes of glory. When John's little eyes or Ezekiel's little eyes or Isaiah's little eyes looked on this God, their vocabulary failed them because they saw a God that far exceeded imagination. And this Ezekiel saw these creatures that are beyond the scripture and said, well, they look like this. They had the appearance of that. But all of a sudden, I saw there was a, there was a whole other world above them. He said, I looked and there was a layer. And I looked above that layer and I saw something. The only way I know to tell you is it was looked like a throne. And upon that thing that looked like a throne, there was something that had the appearance of a man sitting on it. I don't know what else to tell you, but it looked like a man sitting up there. Oh, my God. Then he goes on to say this in verse 27. And I saw as the color of ember, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins upward and from the appearance of his loins downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had the brightness round about it as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. He didn't say it was a rainbow. He said the colors were magnificent. All I know to tell you is it looked like the rainbow. There are going to be some sad folks, some terrified and some fearful folks when they realize what those colors really stand for. Amen. Oh, God, you can wear it around and slap the word pride on it all day long. But I'm going to tell you, it has nothing to do with pride. It has to do with God's presence. Amen. It has to do with the fact that that is who God is. And why do you think he put a rainbow in the clouds after rain? Not just as a symbol of covenant. That's what it is according to Genesis after the flood, yes. But he put a... <laughs> My God, he put the countenance that is around his very throne. When you see that rain coming and when that rain passes and the sunlight hits that, that, that moisture inside of that atmosphere and you see that rainbow stretch across there, God's not just telling you he's not going to flood the earth again. What he's telling you is, is that I've made a covenant with my created. My God, help me. He said, I've made a covenant with my created. And he took a little bit of the glimpse of what's around his throne. And he put, that's why you never find the end of that rainbow, are you? hear me it may go from one to one but you never see for the most part the whole circle because it is where he is and when you see he just put a little fraction of it down here my god are you hearing me he said i saw him and it looked like the rainbow around him my god help us but here's where it really just got a hold of him and it says this it was as the the bow that is in the cloud of the day of rain so was the appearance of of the brightness round about. And look at this next statement. This, he summarizes everything he just saw. And he says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell on my face 
And I heard a voice of one that spake. And he goes on and says, Stand up, son of man. Stand upon my feet, and I will speak to thee. And the Spirit entered into me, and he spake to me. Folks, let me tell you something. Those eyes of fire are upon you. Those eyes of that glorified God are upon you. And when you see who he really is, it says he saw it. And that is the likeness of God's glory. And when I saw it, I fell dead. But God picked me up, and he put his Spirit on me. Let me tell you something, Pentecostal folks. You can't walk in joy in or, or move in that Holy Ghost without first having a glimpse of the glory of Jesus Christ. When Jesus stood on the last day, the great day of that feast, on the eighth day, he, he said, look, they've been pouring water for seven days in that feast. They poured that water on the eighth day. They poured no water. And Jesus stood upon that place where they poured it on the eighth day. And he said, if any man thirst, let him come and drink. And I will give unto him the water of life freely. And the Bible said when John recorded those words, he said, this spake he of the Holy Ghost, which was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Prerequisite number one to have the Holy Ghost moving in you. You need to know to glorify that glorified God. I said we must glorify that glorified God. We got to remember who he is and what he is. And you may not have a vocabulary to describe it, but you ought to reverence it. My God, Ezekiel said, well, let me just summarize it. It was the likeness of the appearance of the glory of God. You want to know what God's glory is? He gave us a description right there. My God. Not only does he say that this was the likeness all through there. This was the appearance. I saw somebody above that firmament on the throne. Looked like the son of man. Looked like a man sitting up there. But he said it was so uh, marvelous. I can't describe it. So when he gets to the end, he, he flip-flops between the word likeness and the word appearance. But when he gets down to the very final description, he says, well, it was like the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He said, well, what was it like? Well, it was kind of like this. Well, what did it look like? Well, I had the appearance of this. He goes, well, let me just put it like this. It was like the appearance of that. <laughs> My God. So now, okay, pastor, so he's glorious. What does that have to do with me? Well, the Bible says this. In 1 Kings chapter number 8, the, uh, uh, the great Solomon, when he built that tabernacle or that temple, rather, what did he pray? He said in, in, in 1 Kings 8 and 28, Lord, would you have respect to the prayer of your servant? And to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer, which thy servant prayeth before thee day and night. And listen to this next phrase. That thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day. And then over in verse 52 he says, That thine eyes may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel, to hearken unto them in all that they call for thee unto thee. Now, what is he saying? I just went through telling you what this eyes of these eyes of glory are. Their eyes are as a flame of fire. They got the likeness of burning amber, of sapphire stone around about them. Those eyes of glory have a rainbow, if you will, surrounding it. A majesty, a splendor with creatures around it that beyond go beyond our earthly description. And Solomon said, you know what, God? I want those eyes to be upon this place. I want to tell you the greatest thing you could have in your life. When God said in Revelation 3.18, buy me gold, tried in the fire that you might be rich, and finishes up with anoint your eyes with eyes salve that you might see. The greatest thing you'll ever see is the glory of the Lord. And the greatest thing you'll ever possess is that glorious eye upon you. That's what you must have. It'll break the yoke of every bondage. It'll send packing every demon of hell. It'll open every blind eyes. Oh, it'll calm every troubled heart. It's the eyes of his glory. Amen. The Bible says this. It said, Lord, let your eyes be upon this place. Back in the book of Genesis, we find a, a young lady. A young lady that's been pulled into a drama she never asked for. Played with a label that maybe she didn't deserve. A woman by the name of Hagar. She's an Egyptian. We can best surmise from the scriptures that Abraham picked her up when he was lying to people and when he left the promised land and went down to Egypt to avoid a famine. He got down there, lied about his wife, 
said, look, I'm going to tell everybody you're my sister. They'll kill me. He comes back. He's got an Egyptian woman as a servant. They can't have children. Hagar ends up bearing a son by the name of Ishmael. But before she does, there comes a time that Sarah said, you know what? I don't want her in my house. It would have been good. You know, it, it probably would have been the normal man thing for Abraham to say, but wait a minute, this was your idea. But that's probably a dangerous move. So Abraham just quietly reserves his I told you so over here in the tent. Sarah runs her off. Hagar gets out there in the wilderness. And in Genesis chapter number 16 and verse 13, she's been out there and the angel of the Lord has found her and said, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I've been run off and blah, 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 blah. The angel of the Lord says, I want you to go back. I want you to go back. Go back and submit yourself to them. It says, the child that you're going to bear, I'm going to raise him up. <clears throat> he will be a mighty man. And you, God had to keep his promise to Abraham. Even though Ishmael was not the promised son, God had made a promise about his son. So even though Ishmael was a product of the flesh, God said, I've got to raise him up as a mighty man because I made a promise. Now, the greater promise was kept through Isaac, but God said to Hagar, said, look, this son that you're going to have, I'll make him a mighty man. He's going to, he's going to have nations under him and all of this. But here is the clincher. Hagar is out there, and she is absolutely destitute. She's an Egyptian and she's in a wilderness in a foreign land. She was a slave. She has no right to anything. She has no livelihood. She has no, no means of survival. But God meets her where she is. <coughs> if you could put somebody in a category that said God would have been better off to leave her alone and let her die, she might be the one in that category. We would have avoided all of the, at least most of the problems of the Islamic conflict today. The Middle Eastern conflict was birthed because of a bad decision on Abraham and Sarah's part. So maybe if, if looking forward in time, somebody deserved to just kind of disappear, maybe Hagar was the one. But you see, that's not how God operates. But God's not willing that any perish. And God is love. And God met a woman who was in a place where she had no means of survival. <coughs> what she had been a part of was contradictory to the very promises of God. She didn't choose it. Not that we see. But she became a participant. But aren't you thankful when we don't deserve it? God still meets us where we are. Yeah. Yes. Say, Pastor, what's this guy there? You just went through all of this about God's glory. Oh, uh, it has everything to do with it. Because we're talking about those eyes of glory. Because you see, Hagar is out in the middle of nowhere. She's running for her life. No means of survival. No means of livelihood. And she's most likely going to die. But there is one person that knows where she is. And he's not just a person. There's an individual that knows where she is, and it is God himself. And the Bible said that God sent an angel to her, told her what to do, and she was going to be all right. And these are her words after that encounter. She says in Genesis 16 and 13, And she called the name of the Lord that spake to her, Thou God seeth me. For she said, I also hear, look after him that has seen me. Now that doesn't sound very profound unless you are pregnant in a wilderness with no food, water, and no means of livelihood, nowhere to go, and you don't know where you are. But God knew where she was. And God came down to where she was. 
Church, listen to this. God came down to where she was. And her words were, God, you mean you see me? Is this the God that, that Abraham has told all of his household about? That you met him in such and such ways and the God that flooded the earth? Are, are you that God and yet... I'm an Egyptian slave woman who does not deserve a single thing. And her greatest, her greatest impression of this God was this. You mean after all that, God, you actually see me? Church, I, I, I have labored to go through the magnitude, the best that we can just see in the little bit of time we have of God's enormous power and glory. Eyes as a flame of fire. But yet the fact that as a gentle God, he still, with all of that glory, sees you in the simplicity of where you are. He knows when you need bread. He knows when you need water. He knows when you need comfort or peace or you need, he, he sees you where you are. And if I may just make this turn to come full circle, the psalmist said, that we are the apple of his eye. <laughs> I said it says we're the apple of his eye. And as a matter of fact, later on, one of the prophets makes this statement. God says, hey, I just want you to know that whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. My God. I'm talking about a God that Ezekiel had no words to describe. I'm talking about a God that the best he could do is said it was kind of like fire. It had the appearance of amber. It had the appearance of a man on a throne. He had no description. He couldn't make sense of it in his vocabulary. But that God says, I see you. And you are the apple of my very eye. Amen. And the great apostle Peter in 1 Peter would echo the sentiment of the Old Testament. And he would say, the Lord's eyes are over the righteous. His ear is attentive to their cry. I just want to tell you tonight, this could go, there's so much, you could go on about the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord, maybe at another time, but for tonight we're going to pray because, folks, I, I really felt impressed tonight that after you see a little glimpse of how glorious this God is, to step back and realize that, realize that he takes care to see where you and I are and to make sure we know that we're so special to him that we are the apple of those eyes of glory. My God. I, I can't even in my mind, I can't even put those things together. I can't read in Isaiah 3 that these are the eyes of glory and also read that I'm the apple of his eye. I, don't, I have no vocabulary for that. I have no mental capacity to understand that. I just have to read it and accept it. That no matter where I've been, no matter what I've done, and no matter what I'm facing right at the moment, God said, I'm the apple of his eye. And Hagar said, I, I deserve nothing. But I just found out something. God sees me. I want you just to in, in this simple moment, hear those words echo in your heart. God sees me. Let those words both terrify and excite you. Remember I told you that fire has basically two primary purposes. To reveal and to refine. God sees me. He sees me where I am and he reveals what I am and he reveals what he is. Remember Isaiah this morning, Isaiah 6, he saw the Lord, then he saw himself. But that same fire also refines. For once we, our eyes have seen the King, we cannot remain where we are. I want to tell you, he sees you tonight. And here's the beautiful part about that. He still loves you anyway. He sees me and all of my frailty and all of my silliness and my mistakes and all of my fleshly decisions and things that I get wrong and have to come back on. He sees every bit of it and he still loves me. 
So tonight, wherever you are, both be terrified and excited that God sees you. But never forget what eyes are seeing you. Their eyes of glory. Come on and let's stand. Musicians, will you come? Tonight, I believe it would be fitting just to gather in this altar and give praise to him that has the likeness of, the appearance of, that this is the appearance of the glory of God, Ezekiel said. He is glorious, and those eyes are upon all of the righteous. Would you just call out to his name tonight? Come on. Don't know what you have need of. You know God knows. But how about we just honor him because he is glorious? Come on. Come on, everybody that will, everybody that will, everybody that will. God, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Oh, you are worthy. You are worthy. Not worried about it, what we sing or whatever. Y'all just do whatever you want to do. But I'm worried about Y'all come on and, and sing. But I want us to just seek the Lord. Let's seek the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
aren't you thankful that he sees you and me and he loves you and me? Almighty oh, God. Come on, just sing that to him, would you? Just Let's just sing that. Come on, all over this field. Come on, let's all just sing that to the Lord. I'm so thankful that he loves you and me. somebody of the Lord.
Thank <laughs> you. 